I'm Liz Summerfield. I work for the Washington Post, and I write a whole lot of marketing apps. And today, we're going to talk about tracking users on single-page apps. Um, and uh, it's not quite as interesting as laser eye cats, <laughs> but we'll see what we can do. Um, first thing I'd like to do is introduce you to Pete. This is Pete. He's your marketing guy. Who's got Pete? Anyone? And this is Chris, engineer. Chris is pretty new to single page apps. Chris has recently learned Angular and has given up jQuery and is very excited about this. But this is what happens on a typical Monday. He comes in. Hey, Chris. I have something I need you to do. You just put this JavaScript on my page right now, please. Can you do it tomorrow? And Chris says, Are you out of your mind? It's not 1990, single page app, blah, 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 blah. Do you have any idea what that can do to our site? And I just don't know how to do this. I have no idea how. But shh, he doesn't help me that. <laughs> so, of course, Pete says, No, I don't know what a single page app is. I don't care. And Chris, open a Jira ticket, see what I can do. So what's Pete asking for and why? Why on earth is Pete going to drive Chris crazy with this? And what he needs is data. He needs to know, in this case, um, he's got some campaign running. And he's promoting his uh, website on Twitter. And he's selling some products. And he wants to know how many people are going to buy them. And he wants to know how many people went through this flow. So he wants to put these things up on the site so that he can collect his data. He doesn't care how it happens, he just wants it done. But why do people do this? Some people want to know how many users visit a specific page, how many impressions were viewed, and then in this case, what percentage of users that see an offer for some product actually go through and buy it, and what percentage of users click on something that they saw. Um, just want some help. So here's the Jira ticket. He actually wrote it. Um, and he's thinking, well, maybe I can just paste this onto my page. I mean, how hard could it be, right? So Chris is fairly new to Angular. He's got a pretty vanilla Angular app. He's using Angular routes. He's got a few routes going. And he's got some attached JavaScript. First thing, Chris thinks is, well, I can just go ahead and paste this in my view. The view will come up. The JavaScript will run. Did it work? Well, wait. How's he going to know if it worked? How are we going to test it? So you have a network panel. That's pretty useful, except that you have to dig through a whole lot of information to get what you want. And you know, no one really wants to sift through all that. And uh, you could use a browser plugin. Ghostery, check it out. Pretty awesome for this. Both for blocking these things when you don't want them to fire on your behalf and for seeing if they worked when you want them to fire on other people's behalf. But don't forget. Check your JavaScript console just in case because we have a couple of pixels we tried to fire on this app. But we have two here, and we see one little thing, and ugh, JavaScript error. Why? Well, Angular's nice enough to save you from yourself, and you cannot go pasting random JavaScript into a view and expect it just to execute perfectly. So this Poor Twitter object that tries to fire here doesn't exist, and you get an error. So Chris, having stuff to do, not wanting to spend a lot of time on this, thinks of things and says, well, what can I do about this? So there's another idea. Happy to get the external JavaScript library to load up without having to think too hard about it, and make sure it fires in the right place. And Chris sticks his code in an iframe. I know, iframe, ugh, scary, scary. But it's not really that scary because it has kind of a nice side effect. It, um, so you can see it loads up in here. We can see our iframe. Like you'd probably want to hide that if you were actually doing this. You don't want anyone to see your pixels. But what this demonstrates, though, is we have our nice, you know, yeoman generated app with bootstrap and all that nice stuff. The iframe looks really ugly. Why? Different DOM. It doesn't have all the fancy bootstrap stuff in it. So you can see that it's rendering separately. It's not picking up that other parent DOM. And you can go ahead and run all the JavaScript you want in there, and it's not going to break your site. All right. And look, there's two little guys that showed up. There's a Google Analytics and a Twitter uh, tracker. And it actually worked. So can Chris go home? It takes just a couple minutes to do this. And 
and you know, it's not the most robust or fancy solution, but if you're in a bind, somebody comes to you and says, I need pixels on this, can you do it right now? You know, the iframe is not the worst thing. In fact, Google Tag Manager itself, which we'll talk about in a bit, tends to use that itself. Um, so the problem here is that it was really fast, and Chris is a victim of his own success. And now Pete is coming over every five minutes, hey, I have a campaign, can you put this on the page? This on the page, I need this, I'm gonna track this. Starting to get out of hand. And now Chris, who used to be developing features, is now putting pixels on pages for a living and he's getting really tired of it. So, we talked a little bit about this. Pros of using this solution. It's a little kludgy, but it's really fast and it keeps that third party code from bothering your application. Cons, as we said, every time something has to change, poor engineer has to go running around at marketing spec and call and add things. So, Chris Google's tag manager. Uh -huh. Hey, get some results. First thing Chris sees is Telium. Have anybody, anyone heard of that one? A couple of people, Telium. It's a very, very common product for this kind of thing. It's also kind of expensive, but very full feature, very good. A um, couple of other big players, Adobe has a tag manager, there are a bunch of open source ones. But really the next hit down here is talking about Google Tag Manager. And since Chris has no budget for this, a free tool is pretty cool. And yeah, the mic's still on? Okay. So Chris finds Google Tag Manager, and Google Tag Manager also says, There we go. Sorry, Wi-Fi problem. Where were we? Somewhere about. We were somewhere around. Light bulb. All right.
and we save it. And now we need a trigger because we created a tag, but it's never going to load up if we have nothing to tell it to actually fire. So we need to create a trigger. And there are a lot of things you can do to actually create a trigger. You can make it trigger fire on a page view, on a click event, uh, based on history change, custom events, and pretty much anything. The JavaScript error even. You can do it based on a timer. Um, in our case, with single page apps, especially a bare bones Angular app, we are looking for history changes. And we're looking for changes. See anything that changes after that pound sign that's going to show that our route has changed. And so we can select all history changes or in our case, we have not one, but two different pixels to fire. If we choose all history changes, then our little Twitter pixel, that first one's going to fire every time somebody clicks on anything on our site. Every time that route changes, the pixel fires. We don't want that. It's too much data to collect. And it's firing in the wrong place. So instead, we want some history changes. And so we create our trigger, and now when you create, when you click on some history changes, the next screen, and it shows a page host name it contains, but the list of the host name doesn't have exactly what we need. But the contains list actually is pretty comprehensive. So we need to take a little detour and create a variable. This variable is going to tell us what thing we're looking for. And it's pretty simple. Like you can stick regular expressions in there, you can stick patterns. It's, it's nice, it's just a little starts with, ends with, that pull down menu is pretty nice. Um, but we only care about that little information after the pound sign in this case. So how do we do that? We can choose the type of fragment. And it's very nice. It's real hard to see there, but there's a tiny bit of gray text down there that when you choose one of these things in this drop-down list, it actually tells you what part of the URL. So you don't really have to know ahead of time. It's kind of nice if you forget or if Google decides to make its own decisions on things. Not that that's ever happened before. Um, but we're lucky. There's a fragment here available for us. We can choose that. We have now created our, we've chosen our fragment variable and then we have decided it ends with landing because that's our landing page. And now we have a variable to go with our trigger and our trigger is complete. Now, the one thing you do need to remember is before you can see any of these changes, you've configured everything, you're great, you look at your site, you're like, ah, what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Because you have to publish your changes. Don't forget to click the red button. Red button, very, very important. Um, the other nice thing about that, because there's a publish button, is it versions everything, so if you screw up, you can also immediately roll back. And that's actually really nice for this stuff, because you don't have to keep track of anything, you don't have to worry if you made that big a mistake. You roll back to the last version, you publish it again, there it is go. Hopefully no one will notice, or no one important notices. So then how do you integrate this onto your site? We didn't cover that yet. We've talked about pasting JavaScript in your pages somewhere and how maybe that's not the best idea. And here I am telling you, just paste this code on your page. But this is a little different. What you're going to do this time is you're actually going to stick it on your main index.html file outside your single page app. Because that single page app's got to load in from somewhere. Some library's got to load in from somewhere. You put this on the front page and it's just watching out there. Doesn't really bother your other app too much. Doesn't interact with anything. And you can go ahead and let Google Tag Manager manage your trigger rules by watching your history or any other thing you can do. Because I said many other things in this. It's pretty deep tool. You can get into it and play with it. Um, but this is a really good example of, of a real world use for it. And um, you're Kind of done. Turns out Chris did just based on the page. So now, hey Pete. Yes. <laughs> it's like I just set up your Google Tag Manager. You can do this all yourself. <coughs> Is that great? Yeah. Pete, not so happy. But Chris, very, very happy. So a couple other things. This is kind of a long rambling slide, but I am going to talk about a couple other things here because um, there's some things I didn't cover here, and the reason why is it's not a whole lot of time to get into the depths of this, but there's a fantastic module called Angularx out there. Has anyone ever used that? Really, just a couple of people? Check it out because what it's great for is when you need something more than a simple tag,
Flag Manager, and you have to collect a lot of different data in your applications, and you want to fire events based on things that happen within your single page app, especially Angular. I mean, in this case, this is an Angular module, so that's what you can use it with. You can programmatically trigger things through this in a really, really simple way. You just one little call and your magic trigger happens, rather than trying to write a whole lot of code around it. So for those of you who have to track with, who uses Google Analytics? Omnisure? Anyone? Wow, only a couple. That's interesting. Um, so how many people don't just use Google Analytics for page, single page loads, but also do event-based tracking with that? So you, no, a couple still. That's good. Well, this, this um, tool here actually will be your friend if you're not using it. Really makes that easy. And it sort of, um, it makes it nice that you can trigger actions through this library and you can, in fact, swap out your tracking library. So if you, your company suddenly said, okay, we went to Adobe, we purchased Omniture, go get rid of that Google, Google Analytics code, put Omniture in, actually all you have to do is swap out the module and magically your tracking is still going to work. Um, some of your custom events may need a little tweaking, but for the most part, you can pass data through this module in and fire off your uh, your tracking. You can track with any number of libraries, a lot of them. Um, but does anybody else use any other uh, data tracking analytics suites other than Google Analytics and Omniture? What do you use? Mixpanel. Oh, I've never used it. <laughs> do you like it? Good to know. I'll check it out. Another one. New Relic. New Relic, yeah. Common. Slightly common, at least. Heard of that one. <laughs> um, so I think, though, the big risk here, something I just want to point out at the bottom of the slide, is when you are embedding these things into your single page apps, um, beware of people who like to block your ads. <laughs> And be very well sure that you're going to trap any JavaScript errors you might get from a missing library or a blocked library because you don't want your whole app to blow up just because somebody likes their ad blocker a lot. I mean, we're probably some of the most guilty ad blocker users, but we're also the ones who really want other people not to use them. And so that one can really bite you if you happen to be um, trying to pop up a bunch of things that people don't want you to. Um, so that's pretty much the end of it for any any questions? Try catch around certain things just to make sure that 
if there's some sort of third party thing, I don't really know what it does, but I've embedded it in there and I want to make sure that if something errors out, I can, you know, it doesn't blow up my site. But we also do some amount of ad blocking detection and we do um, provide different experiences for users based on that. So some of you may have come to the Washington Post over the last couple of months or seen news articles about this where you come and suddenly your ad blocker's on, give us your email address to keep going. Or your ad blocker's on, pay us. And that got back there. Uh, um, so those are things that you can do. You, you can detect uh, whether or not people are using those things through several different means. Um, and, and you can actually you know, pull your applications to do other things based on that stuff. Um, but whether or not you can sort of force an ad through, even sometimes you can get around it if you, if you minimize your code and the ad blocker can't figure it out. Um, you can proxy that stuff if you really, really want to. Uh, but the ad blockers are getting smarter. It's pretty hard. And um, I don't know, sometimes it's not worth your time. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Really, if you have any questions, uh, Google, Twitter, Carrier Pigeon. And if you like JS and you like Rest, we're hiring. <laughs>